we're going to look this morning at a familiar text, James chapter 4, verse 4. I want to look at that verse in its context. This verse, you know, is about the sin of worldliness, which is not a sin that seems to trouble Christians today very much. At least they don't trouble themselves with it. I would say in many ways, though, this is the besetting sin of 21st century evangelicalism so far. Some of you might cringe to hear me say that because the the word worldliness itself has a old-fashioned sound to it. It's the kind of word that your old maid aunt would, would use, and she would only use it when she wanted to criticize your music or your clothing or some other aspect of your style. But your great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents in their generation, preachers warned against the sin of worldliness a lot. And that's kind of remarkable because we're talking about the first half of the 20th century That was during the Great Depression and two world wars. And looking back, you might think that compared to today, the world then was a lot less appealing than it is today. Worldliness could not possibly have been a greater temptation to that generation than it is now. And to be honest, our grandparents and great-grandparents' generation may have gone overboard criticizing every element of style that they didn't like, it, every modern innovation that they didn't understand by saying these things are worldly. I once had a woman tell me that I was worldly for wearing contact lenses rather than glasses. Back when I was in college, she assumed that my only motive for wearing contacts was cosmetic. And in the course of scolding me for my vanity, she said, you shouldn't be ashamed of wearing glasses. She said, I like you the way God made you. And I said, but God didn't make me with glasses. And she said, you know what I mean. I'm not sure she knew what she meant, but, but she was adamant about it. And she was using the accusation of worldliness as a sort of quick and easy way to discredit every petty thing that she didn't approve of. And it's true that there was probably too much of that kind of thing, especially in fundamentalist circles, even 50 or 75 years ago. American fundamentalism was definitely infected somewhere along the way with a hypercritical spirit, and it bred contentiousness, it fostered a kind of sanctimonious, holier-than-thou disdain for others. It tended to turn people into hypocrites who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. That's how Jesus described the Pharisees in Luke 18, verse 9. But We clearly have, I think, the opposite problem today. The Christians have reacted against hyper-fundamentalism by by going as far as possible in the opposite extreme. When was the last time you heard any leading evangelical mention worldliness as a sin? Christians nowadays don't seem to think this is a very dangerous thing, or it's it's, it's not a very serious or at least potentially soul-destroying sin. And it's not that the verses that deal with this issue are unfamiliar to us. We know them all. Bring up, for example, 1 John chapter 2, verses, verse 15, do not love the world. Quote that verse in a circle of your Christian friends, and you're likely to hear an extended discussion or have an extended conversation about what that verse doesn't mean. It obviously can't mean that we're not supposed to love the people of the world. It isn't telling us to treat unbelievers with disdain. It isn't a call for Christians to court the world's hostility by, you know, posting signs in our yards that mock our neighbors' beliefs. It doesn't give us permission to use Twitter or Facebook as a way to insult people we disagree with, anyone who's in bondage to sin. And it doesn't mean we should retreat into a monastic lifestyle. And all of that is true. It doesn't mean any of those things. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10, Paul tells the believers in Corinth, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. But, he says, I did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, for then you'd have to go out of the world. So we are not supposed to cut ourselves off from the world and live in Christian enclaves. After all, the world is our mission field. Mark 16, 15 gives us the Lord's great commission in these, worlds, these words, go into all the world 
and preach the gospel to all creation. And everyone knows that God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world. That's John 3:16 and 17. That's the most famous passage in the entire New Testament. So we're not supposed to hate what God loves, right? And it's true, do not love the world doesn't mean we should have contempt for the mission field where we have been sent to be laborers for Christ. But unfortunately, the conversation often stops at that point. You're not as likely to hear a solid explanation of what Scripture does mean when it tells us not to love the world. And as a result, in the church today, it's pretty rare to meet Christians who really understand what a deadly danger worldliness poses. They've never seriously contemplated the fact that worldliness is a sin. And in fact, there are Christians, including some Christian leaders who are sinfully obsessed with all of the whims and entertainments of the world. Chasing the latest fad is, I think, evangelicalism's favorite pastime, and people seem to think they can harness all the world's fads for evangelistic strategies. So they work hard to adopt all the badges of worldly style and all the key elements of worldly wisdom. They immerse themselves in worldly amusements. They crave popularity and worldly approval. They may try to convince you that, the, the, that a neck tattoo of the Bible or a, of a Bible verse or some religious symbol is going to be a more effective evangelistic tool than a real testimony. That is the lowbrow form of evangelical worldliness. There is a highbrow form as well, evangelical elitists who are driven by an unhealthy craving for academic acclaim. They become so desperate to win scholarly street cred that they end up apostatizing in the process. And closely related to that brand of worldliness is the current evangelical preoccupation with celebrity status, a a yearning for popularity and fame, a craving to be noticed by other people like the Pharisees of whom Jesus said, they do all their deeds to be seen of others. But unlike the Pharisees, today's evangelical fame seekers don't necessarily try to make any show of public piety. They're hungry for the world's applause and And the world today isn't particularly impressed by religion. Jesus said of the Pharisees, I I, truly, truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. What he was saying is that they wanted this world's praise and recognition. They got it, but that is all they would get for their fame seeking. That's worldliness in its most narcissistic form. And then there are those who seem to think that we can save the world if we just win enough elections. And so they throw themselves into politics and and learn the art of compromise, and then they barter away their convictions or their testimony in exchange for political advantage. And perhaps I think maybe nothing is more worldly than the notion that Caesar's authority could be harnessed by the church and put to good use. Very few Christians are able to devote themselves full-time to politics like that and maintain an uncompromising commitment to Christ. Because after all, the most pressing priority for a politician is to win votes in the election. And so worldliness thrives among evangelicals who are sold-out political activists, and that's true on both sides of the political spectrum. And so the evangelical movement has basically been commandeered by people who think that if we can get the world to think that we are cool or sophisticated or worldly wise or politically correct, then worldly people will come to Jesus. That is the distilled essence of sinful worldly mindedness, and that is precisely what Scripture forbids. Do not marvel, brothers, if the world hates you. That's 1 John 3.13. And listen to what Jesus said in John 15, verses 18 through 20. He said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So the idea there is not, well, maybe the world will hate you and maybe it won't. 
the clear message there is that we, if we are faithful to Christ, the world will most certainly hate you. If you love Christ, they already hate what you stand for. According to Jesus, we don't belong to this world anyway, and he also said in his high priestly prayer that he himself is not of this world. Matthew 10, 22, Jesus says, You'll be hated by all because of my name. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and the slave like his master. If they've called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? And 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So we're not being able, we're not being faithful to Christ if our, if our aim is to fit into the fraternity of those who hate him. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. That is our text, James 4, verse 4. And it's a verse that's even more strongly worded than 1 John 2, 15, love not the world. James is so emphatic that it's really difficult to sidestep or explain away what he's saying here. And so this is the text I want to focus on. James 4, verse 4, here's the whole text from the LSB. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. Now, let me speak bluntly. I'm convinced that the majority of today's evangelicals simply don't believe the truth of that verse. Friendship with the world is quite literally their primary goal. If you were to compile an up-to-date list of the 15 largest, most influential megachurches and then analyze the common features of their ministry philosophy, you will discover that most, if not all of them, seem to think that the only effective way to attract an audience today is to give unchurched people a worldly spectacle with noise and flashing lights and a smoke machine. You have to draw your message from blockbuster movies instead of from the Bible. Embrace the world's fads and fashions and the music. And and don't mention negative-sounding themes like sin and righteousness and judgment. But according to Jesus in John 16, 8, the only business the Holy Spirit has with worldly people is to convict unbelievers concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. You'd probably never know that if you, if you, if, if you, everything you ever knew about Christianity came from the typical 21st century megachurch. You'd never hear that, that the Holy Spirit's business is to convict people of sin and righteousness and judgment. You'd hear motivational talks, you'd hear movie reviews, You'd hear lots of storytelling. Sermonizing like that has left church members susceptible to all of the values and passions and lusts of this world, and that's a major reason worldliness has become the besetting sin of the contemporary evangelical movement. And let me be painfully frank with you. I can't exclude myself from that judgment, and neither should you, because we live in a culture that... that relentlessly courts our participation in all kinds of evil. And in fact, secular society is now literally demanding our acquiescence to ungodly activities, unbiblical opinions, anti-Christian values. They do this by overtly appealing to the lust of the, uh, the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life through entertainment and advertising and the internet and every imaginable medium. It, it assaults us nonstop. And we don't do enough to resist the pressure. Some Christians today will gladly go along with and even celebrate literally anything that the unbelieving world is currently enthralled with. But as Christians, we're supposed to be different, distinctively different, holy. You can't do that unless you put the world and its values in their proper place. And James's words in this text are aimed at people like you and me. And notice, James is going for clarity here, not diplomacy, because he uses the kind of rhetoric that would cause today's guardians of evangelical tone to have, you know, fits of apoplexy. You adulteresses, that's how he starts out. 
Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. This is not gentle language. So let's look at this, and let's look briefly at the context of James 4. There are some key themes that run through the first 12 verses of this passage. One of them is war. That is a literal translation, but he's not talking about literal armed conflict. This is, about, this is not about land wars between nations. In fact, the LSB gets the proper sense of it. Verse 1, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? And in the middle of verse 2, you murder, you fight, and you quarrel. Verse 4, our text mentions hostility towards God. And then verse 6, God is opposed to the proud. And verse 7, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. So the idea that runs through this is a fierce conflict, a struggle to obtain something we covet. It's a conflict between two incompatible value systems. And the root issue in all of those conflicts, he says, is illicit desires, lust. Verse 1, your pleasures wage war in your members. Verse 2, you lust and do not have, so you murder. And by the way, he has not in mind their literal murder. I mean, it includes that, but he's talking about the whole class of sins that Jesus says is morally tantamount to murder, which would include hatred, anger, bitterness, even deliberately insulting epithets. All of those things are rooted, James says, in wrong desires, lusts. Continuing with verse 2, you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And then he turns to the issue of prayer. You can kind of trace his thinking if you follow the thread here. What's the answer to unfulfilled desires? Prayer. You do not have because you do not ask. But pray for things that you can have legitimately, not the fulfillment of fleshly lusts. And he says all of those things. And by the way, there's some uncanny parallels between James 4 and Matthew 7. It's almost like the Sermon on the Mount is reverberating in James's mind while he writes this chapter. Matthew 7, 1 says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. In other words, don't judge other people unrighteously. And James picks up that same theme in this chapter, verses 11 and 12. He who slanders a brother or judges his brother slanders the law and judges the law. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Matthew 7, that's also where Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. For everyone who asks receives. James, I think, has that very promise in mind when he says in verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. He's saying your wrong desires, these lusts that are at the, the root of every problem are a hindrance to your prayer life, and there's that theme of evil desire. Now get this, evil desire, lust, but We're not just talking about sexual lust here. Evil desire of any kind, a desire for something that you cannot righteously have, is at the very heart of the problem of worldliness. That's what John says in that verse I began with, 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So think this through with me. James 4 covers what seems to be a wide array of issues, quarrels and fighting, evil desires and covetousness, a misguided, lust-driven prayer life. And then, but now in our text, he draws all of those themes together in one idea, and it's this idea of worldliness. He distills every category of, of evil desire that he has mentioned into the picture of friendship with the world. Because Only an earthly-minded, self-absorbed worldling would provoke unnecessary conflict in the community of faith or desire what he can't righteously have or pray for things to be spent on illicit passions. All of those sins are related and they feed one another. And think about this. James knew that these people were worldly because of the way they prayed. He doesn't call them worldly because they shopped on Rodeo Drive or whatever. He calls them worldly because of how they prayed. He verbally lays into them. You adulteresses, he's saying, you you wretched wannabe worldlings, don't you understand what a vile sin it is to court the world's favor and friendship? 
See, Jesus didn't send us into a neutral culture to try to make friends with the world. He sent us into an incorrigibly hostile world to echo his call to repentance and to make disciples of everyone who hears that call. And we're supposed to summon those people out of the world rather than trying to fit in with the rest of the crowd. And we can't do any of that apart from God's grace. But, James says in verse 6, he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Be subject, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and cry. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. In other words, you take all of that and what he's saying is that humility is the biblical answer to worldliness. Humility is the polar opposite of worldly pride in one's lusts and lifestyle. He's talking about the kind of humility that resists the tents, tempts and uh, the taunts and temptations of the devil. But it's a humility that willingly accepts the contempt and derision of a hostile world. It's also the kind of profound humility that causes us to be miserable and mourn and cry. He's calling us to gospel humility. This is the natural product of authentic repentance. And it's obvious from James's tone that the people he is writing to, he believed were, were lacking in the features of godly humility. They were so devoid of submission to God and purity of heart and single-minded devotion to Christ that it seems James may not be fully convinced that they're even converted. He calls them sinners and double-minded. He rebukes them as sharply as possible for their worldliness. And it may be that those people, like like so many of today's typical casual church-going evangelicals, had never really even considered what a vile sin it is to love the world and the things that are in the world. And so he describes here the sin of worldliness in the clearest and most explicit language possible. And from this verse alone, we can deduce three reasons worldliness actually ranks among the most evil of all sins. Three reasons that worldliness is a sin of the very worst order. Reason number one, he says it's an act of spiritual adultery. This really seems like quite an abrupt transition, doesn't it, going from verse 3 to verse 4? Because remember, the subject at hand in verse 3 is the question of why their prayers aren't being answered. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. He's saying, you aren't praying the way Jesus taught us to pray. You're asking for all the wrong things. Jesus promised that everyone who asks receives does not apply to carnal prayers. If your prayers are driven by your own lusts rather than by a zeal for the glory of God, if you aren't even asking God for the things Jesus told us to pray for, then you aren't really praying in Jesus' name, are you? And then there's this sudden, shocking, sharp rebuke. You adulteresses. You know, compared to our postmodernized ideas of what civil discourse ought to sound like, it does seem a little over the top, doesn't it? I'll tell you, I wouldn't use it on you. But think about this. Just a few, a few verses later, verse 11, he's going to say, do not speak against one another, brethren. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Just a few verses later. Now think about this. Both of those texts are inspired and inerrant scripture, and that means that however you seek to apply verses 11 and 12, you can't interpret them in a way that would rule out the kind of harsh rebuke James himself delivers in verse 4. And it's certainly harsh. If the change in tone between verse 3 and verse 4 doesn't make you sit up and take notice, you aren't listening very carefully. He goes from admonishing them about the deficiencies of their prayer life to this angry-sounding accusation of adultery. And the harshness of the expression he uses gives us, I think, a true measure of the seriousness of the sin of, of worldliness. And by the way, even though he uses the feminine form, adulteresses, he's not just singling out women here. There's no suggestion that he has 
any specific individuals in mind. His point is that the church is the bride of Christ, and so Christians who are unfaithful to him are comparable to an unfaithful wife, uh, an adulteress. He's writing to people who let their own worldly desires govern what they pray for. So let's face this honestly. We all deserve this rebuke to one degree or another. Now, why the sudden shift from the defects of a selfish prayer life to the subject of worldliness? Well, remember, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. He's saying there that worldliness is driven by lust and carnal, self-centered, self-serving pride, just like the misguided prayers he's talking about. They are an expression of worldliness. Self-indulgent prayer is quite simply an expression of a worldly heart. Maybe nothing is more worldly than asking God to fulfill desires that are fueled by all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and so on. So don't let it escape your notice that virtually all American televangelists are teaching people to pray precisely that way. It's a serious problem. You turn on supposedly Christian television, and what you're likely to get is someone aggressively encouraging his listeners to pray for material wealth and expensive cars and other tokens of a worldly and self-indulgent lifestyle, and James is implying there really isn't any grosser sin than that. If you're a Christian who pretends to be passionately opposed to the sins, the moral sins of secular culture, but you never raise a peep of protest about the worldliness and the spiritual corruption that is broadcast on religious television networks night and day, I don't know how people can live with the kind of, that kind of hypocrisy. James will have none of it. He equates worldliness in the Christian community with the sin of serial adultery. And he's using a metaphor here. He's saying a worldly Christian is like a bride who sleeps around, who plays the harlot. Someone who is pledged to Christ should love Christ, but if he loves the world instead, he's behaving like a spiritual prostitute. There's no nice way to say it. He isn't trying to be nice. And by the way, that would be a familiar metaphor to James's Jewish readers because the Old Testament repeatedly said that Israel's infidelity to God was actually a form of spiritual harlotry. And some of the language about this in the Old Testament is very strong, almost too explicit for children's ears, frankly. In fact, here's one comparatively mild example from Jeremiah chapter 3, where God is recounting to the prophet Jeremiah how the southern kingdom of Judah didn't learn the lesson that she should have gained from the judgment of the northern kingdom, which had already taken place. And uh, he says this, Jeremiah 3, verse 6, Yahweh said to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what faithless Israel did? Israel being the northern kingdom. She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. I said, after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah, that's the southern kingdom, saw it. And I saw for, that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. So it was because of the lightness of her harlotry that she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. That's an interesting expression there. Committed adultery with stones and trees. That's a description of people who worshipped idols that were made of stone and wood. And James, in our text, is echoing that principle, that people who love the world and, and court the world's love in return are playing like whores with the world. If you find that metaphor shocking, remember that Jesus repeatedly used that very same terminology in his condemnations of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees in Matthew 20 or Matthew 12, verse 39, and then again in Matthew 16, verse 4, when a a group of these spiritual phonies came to him and demanded that he perform a sign to prove who he was, he called them and their followers an evil and adulterous generation. Because there's nothing more worldly than demanding visible proof 
when you know you already have sufficient grounds to believe, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. So worldliness is serious because it's an act of spiritual adultery. Here's a second reason worldliness is a sin of the very worst order. Reason number two, it's an expression of blatant hostility towards God. Specifically, to love the world is to be hostile towards God. You can't be friends with God and make friends with the world at the same time. And that should be obvious to any believer. James says his readers ought to have been fully aware of this principle. So he frames this as a question, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? How could you not know that? Worldliness is nothing more than an expression of contempt for what God loves. Now, again, there is a true and vital sense in which God so loved the world. He loves the human race because, after all, he made us in his own image. He he intervened to save humanity from utter destruction by redeeming a remnant. And so the enmity that's described here is not personal malice from God towards people, God does, however, abominate the way fallen people think and what they do and what they believe and what they love and what they desire. It's the system of this world. In other words, God has no love for the world's treasures or its amusements or its honors. The values and ambitions and longings of this world are all evil. Again, 1 John 2.16, they are the cravings of sinful people, the lust of their eyes, and their boasting. That's how the NIV puts 1 John 2.16. And what John is saying is God hates those things. Here's how Genesis 6.5 describes the world God hates. Yahweh saw that the evil of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then in one of the great anthropopathic statements of Scripture, verse 5 says, and Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And you say, well, that was before the flood. Then he wiped out all those bad people and were left with Noah. But even after the flood, as soon as Noah emerges from the ark and makes an offering, Scripture tells us, Yahweh smelled the soothing aroma, and Yahweh said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Lamentations 3.22 says, It's only because of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, because his compassions fail not. So this fallen world that has set itself against God, and and, and he himself is against everything the the fallen world cherishes, means it's folly for us as believers to think that we can domesticate our culture and win people to Christ by trying to make friends with a fallen world. It's even more foolish to think that the Bible gives us any kind of mandate to win the admiration of the world. And so even though lots of postmodern evangelicals think that cultivating friendship with the world is a smart church growth strategy, to think that way, James says, is to oppose God. And more than that, to try to make peace or forge friendly relations with an evil system, the evil philosophy that dominates this world, a philosophy that is openly hostile to God, to try to compromise with it or embrace as much of it as you can is to show contempt for the one who actually deserves our love the most. This principle applies to all of the kings of this world, their philosophies, their values, their belief systems, everything about the world system, right up to the chief ruler of this world system, the devil himself. All of them are, to one degree or another, openly hostile and aggressively hostile against God and and hostile to the truth itself. Jesus repeatedly called Satan the ruler of this world. And the Apostle Paul's language in 2 Corinthians 4.4 is even stronger. He calls Satan the god of this age. 1 John 5.19, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So, Scripture's clear. Satan has a stranglehold on this world, its values, its ways of thinking, its philosophies. And Satan is at war with God. We're like Israel at the foot of Sinai when Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for Yahweh, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered to him. As Christians, we're supposed to be on the Lord's side. 
We're at war. And it is a serious cosmic conflict. Ephesians 6, verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And furthermore, this is a battle we are called to fight, not to be spectators or commentators or referees. This is a war that will not be resolved through diplomacy. That's true that the Weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. That's 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. We don't fight with literal swords or acts of violence or terrorism. This is an ideological battle. It's a war of values and belief systems and worldviews. Our role in this battle is to tear down those philosophical strongholds that the world has erected, they are belief systems and false ideas that are designed to keep people in bondage. This is the kind of fighting we do, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We tear down speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It's talking about our belief systems, our philosophies, our worldviews. It's not a flesh and blood war, but it is a campaign to liberate people from the bondage of corrupt values, evil beliefs, and the wicked, demonic doctrines that dominate this fallen world. And you can't accomplish that. You can't fight this war faithfully by seeking friendly relations with a system that is under the control of the devil. To think that as Christians... We can make friends with the the beliefs and values of this fallen world. That is an expression of blatant hostility against God. It takes a sinfully rebellious heart even to flirt with that kind of thinking. And that's a third reason why worldliness is so full of evil mischief. First, it's an act of spiritual adultery. Second, it's an expression of blatant hostility. Third, and finally, worldliness is a sin of the very worst order because... It is a crime of diabolical treachery. Look at the last phrase of our verse. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. So worldliness, he portrays it as a deliberate act of treason against God. If you're a Christian, you won't become a friend of the world by accident. The world doesn't make friends with Christians. Christians have to make friends with the world. And in order to do that, the, re- the world requires some degree of disloyalty to Christ. If you refuse to betray Christ, you, you can't be friends with a world that hates him. We owe Christ our full and uncompromising loyalty. One of the wonderful realities about the work of Christ in our salvation is that he gave himself for his sins, uh, for our sins, so that, we, so that he might wreck you... Let me say that again. He gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. That's Galatians 1.4 and Colossians 1.13. He rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the son of his love. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. We are strangers and exiles on the earth. We owe heaven our full allegiance. Hebrews 12.22 You've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the festal gathering and assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. That's where we belong. And in a real but spiritual sense, God has raised us up and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 6. And therefore, Paul says, Colossians 3, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. So we are called and commanded to be heavenly minded. I'm sure you've heard the familiar complaint that some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. And I suppose there is an extreme form of phony religiosity that's practiced by, you know, some religious quacks and imposters of whom that little aphorism might be a good description. I've known a few people here and there who practice a kind of faux piety that comes across like a a goofy brand of otherworldliness. So, okay, use that 
use that, reserve that statement for them. But seriously, does anyone think it's a major problem among today's evangelicals that we're all too heavenly minded? Does anyone think that's a real widespread problem with our faces buried in our cell phones and our minds glued to whatever is trending on Twitter and our televisions programmed to TiVo, whatever's on HBO, while we watch some trivial and totally fake reality program? That's not heavenly mindedness. You know that, right? A more fitting description of the average evangelical today is he is so earthly-minded that he is of no good to either heaven or the church. Our constant fixation on every whim and novelty that is currently trending in the world is a dangerous pursuit. Fad chasing is not, and it never has been, a road that leads to Christ. It's a devilish ruse that points us away from heaven while it ignores every instrument of sanctification and, and all the essential means of grace. It's a hindrance to our holiness. And if you've carelessly allowed yourself to be seduced and diverted by this world's noise and self-promotion, you're on a dangerous path. But you can repent and recover your first love, and you urgently need to do that. But if, on the other hand, you have willfully pursued harmony and comradeship with this world, if you wish to be a friend of the world, if you choose to be a friend of the world, if you purposely make yourself a friend of the world, that is an act of deliberate spiritual treason. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. Just as you cannot serve God and mammon in the same way and for the same reasons, you cannot be friendly to the world and do the work of God at the same time. No one can serve two masters. Demas, I think, is one of the saddest characters in the New Testament. When Paul wrote Philemon, Demas was serving as one of the five key people on Paul's missionary team. Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. He names them by name in verse 24 of Philemon. Demas' name even precedes Luke in the order that Paul listed them. And he refers to Demas as one of my fellow workers. Demas is still with Luke when when Paul writes to the Colossians, just before signing off in Colossians 4.14, Paul writes, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. So here's a guy who was a fellow worker with the leading apostle, a close companion with Luke, who wrote two of the longest books in the New Testament. Demas was at the heart of the action while Paul was at the peak of his missionary activity. And even after Paul was imprisoned, Demas remained with him for a time because Philemon was written from prison and Demas was close by, Paul said. He must have been a gifted worker to have earned such a place in Paul's inner circle. Traveling with him, seeing the evidence of God's hand on Paul's ministry, Demas had every advantage He had the very best teacher in the early church as his personal mentor. And for a long time, he seemed faithful enough. But when we last meet Demas in the New Testament, it's at the end of Paul's life and ministry. Paul is waiting his execution. He is still faithful. He's encouraging Timothy to stay at the task. And in the closing chapter of the last epistle Paul ever wrote, we read this, 2 Timothy 4, verses 9 through 11. Be diligent to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Only Luke is with me. I've always thought that 2 Timothy ends on a kind of a sad note. You know, Paul records what happened when he was put on trial. Verse 16, at my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Verse 11, Only Luke is with me. But Paul goes on to say, The Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the preaching might be fulfilled and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. And furthermore, verse 18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will save me unto his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we know Paul's going to be okay, no matter what. Verse 7, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And so 
While at first glance, this may seem sad for Paul that he was abandoned by everybody, including Demas, and then left to stand alone, the apostle punctuates that chapter with so much triumph that we don't need to feel bad about the last chapter of Paul's life. In fact, we can be encouraged by it. Paul's life did not end in tragedy, but in great triumph. And in fact, the most profoundly sad character in 2 Timothy 4 is Demas, the worldling, who had every opportunity to serve Christ and suffer for Christ's sake alongside the Apostle Paul, but he squandered every advantage he ever enjoyed for a mess of worldly pottage. If he had remained faithful, he would have enjoyed eternal honor in heaven, but he gave it up, gave up every opportunity he ever had for eternal reward because he had this sleazy fascination with this present world. Demas' sin, I think, does have a lot in common with Judas's treachery. This was sheer betrayal. Worldliness is, after all, a sin of the worst order. It's a crime of diabolical treachery. By the way, Demas is the polar opposite of Moses. You know, Moses grew up as Pharaoh's adopted son. He stood in line to inherit all of the wealth and power of Pharaoh. But Moses gave up every privilege the world could offer, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin regarding the, approach of Christ, regarding the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. That's a good perspective. You know, the world will promise you wealth and privilege and fame and honor, but the true pathway to eternal glory is the one Moses took. He chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. That's what makes worldliness so utterly foolish. Everything you might be tempted to love in this world, everything the world uses as bait to seduce you, all of it will decay and summarily be destroyed. And in comparison to eternity, this world is far too short-lived to to warrant all the interest and attachment that it demands from us. I've quoted 1 John 2, 15 and 16 several times. Now listen to verse 17. The world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Romans 13, 12 The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 1 Corinthians 7, 29, the time is short. Now, if time was short at the end of the first century, Christ's return is closer than it's ever been right now. It's folly to attach our affections to this world. Verse 31, the form of this world is passing away. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Nothing, and that means absolutely nothing in this swiftly passing world, should ever overwhelm our love for Christ. I'll close with this. People who truly love God will always provoke the world's hatred. That's inevitable. But to love the world is to provoke God's displeasure. Each of us faces a choice then. Whose enemy do you want to be? Let's pray. Father, forgive us for having cold hearts and wandering affections. May we see this fallen world for what it really is, a spiritually dangerous realm that is cursed and corrupted by sin. For us as Christians, this world is just a fleeting testing ground for our faith. So keep us faithful. Let the fire of love that we had when we first knew Christ never grow dim or burn low. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.